self-development with tactics. Today, a new book that we're going to go through, which is Inhydrion of Epictetus. Well, why of Epictetus? By Epictetus. You know, it was written by Epictetus, which is a book about Stoicism. And or Epictetus was a Stoic. And I mean, it probably is a book you know about. People have been recommending it. People have been talking about it and whatnot. But I actually wanted to, to read the book per se. But I found... A summary here. So I thought, well, you know, let's go through the summary. You know, I could do that. I could make that. Um, and so we're gonna just uh, look through that. And yeah, and then see, you know, maybe afterwards I'm actually gonna read the book because it is interesting. But now everything is kind of decided by the quality of this book summary, which is not good because who knows how good it is. Anyway, summary notes. As this is a book of aphorisms, all the following lines are direct quotations. I do, by the way, think that I already went through it at some point of time, but I don't care. Men are disturbed not by the things which happen, but by the opinions about the things. That's truly the case. I mean, if you think about it, when something happens to you, you know, let's say something bad is happening. You know, and something bad being, okay, you crash your car. We, we view it as something bad. You know, because we crashed our car, it's costing a lot of money and whatnot. But let's imagine, let's imagine this is kind of a, a you know, not trend, but um, some tradition that you crash your first car. If this was a tradition, you know, if we assume that it is a tradition, then it wouldn't be anything like bad. You know, it would actually kind of be good and cool and amazing. Yeah, you've crashed your car. Your friends are going to be amazed about that. And they're going to be happy about that, that you fucking crashed your first car. The first moment you've driven it. But well, it's, it's not the case. So this is the problem. And this is the thoughts and all the opinions that we're having about things. And or the opinion of society about things. And this is fucked up and shitty. And um, fucked up and shitty. <coughs> Let's see. Now. Uh, to blame others for his own bad condition. Well, actually, you know what? We're going to go through something else. I just decided. I just decided to go through something else. And as you can see, there's a ton of different book summaries. For example, the moral sayings of Publius Cyrus and or Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, which I just, I don't know, can't imagine what this is about. And therefore... Or actually striking distance, Bruce Lee and the dawn of martial arts in America. Uh -huh. Or Kevin Kelly, the inevitable book summary. Well, is this actually the right section? Yeah, it actually is. But why did I skip so many? Or Sam Harris, free will. Sounds great, actually. Steven Pinker, enlightenment now. Also sounds good. Joseph Campbell, the hero with a thousand faces. Uh, will Durant, the story of philosophy book. James P. Carr's Finite and Infinite Games, or Kevin Keller, The Inevitable. Well, let's actually, uh, let's go through the free will. I don't actually know if I went through it already, it kind of sounds too good, and also the cover is too great, as if I didn't already go through it, but I don't care. Let's see. And if I don't like it, I'm going to skip it. Free Will by Sam Harris. Book summary. What is in it for me? Learn why the concept of free will is an illusion and what to do about it. Are you really in control of your every action? Is the fact that you're even skimming this text something that you con consciously chose to do out of your own so-called free will? Question mark. The answer is no. Free will is an illusion and the following book summaries will explain why. New insights from neuroscience research shows that how we think and what we do every day has very little to do with our free will. We are not in control and to better understand why we do what we do, it's important to better understand exactly how our mind works. After reading this book summary, you will learn 
why it's your brain that's thirsty, not you. Why a seemingly bloodthirsty murderer doesn't... Well, I'm so interested in the fucking Shrugged book. I don't know why, but I actually really want to go through it. I'm very sorry for skipping it two times now. Maybe I'm actually going to go through Sam Harris' book uh, some other time, but let's see. I, uh, I don't know why I'm so interested in it. It, it. it sounds so... Actually, pretty boring. Anyway, I set out to show how desperately the world needs prime movers and how viciously it treats them. And I show it on a hypothetical case what happens to the world without them. James Taggart sat at his desk. He looked like a man approaching 50 who had crossed into age from adolescence without the intermediate stage of youth. He had a small, petulant mouth and thin hair clinging to a bald forehead. His posture had a limp, decentralized slobbiness as if defiance of his tall, slender body, a body with an elegance of line intended for the confident poise of an aristocrat, but transformed into the gawkins of a lout. The flesh of his face was pale and soft, his eyes were pale and veiled with a glance that moved slowly, never quite stopping, gliding off and past things in eternal resentment of their existence. He looked obstinate and strained. He was 39 years old. A few steps away at the end of the car, a brakeman was adjusting the controls of the air conditioner. He was blonde and young. He was whistling the theme of the symphony. She realized that he had been whistling it for some time and that his was all she had heard. He stopped. He shrugged and smiled. He was alive for a moment and it was the strangest smile she had ever seen. It held secret amusement and heartbreak and an infinite bitterness. He answered, Who is John Gott? She took it as a regrettable accident to be born patiently for a while that she happened to be imprisoned among people who were dull. Twelve years old when she told Eddie Willis that she would run the railroad when they grew up. She was 15 when it occurred to her for the first time that women did not run railroads and that people might object. To hell with that, she thought, and never worried about it again. Many stories were whispered about him. It was said that in the wilderness of the Middle West, he murdered a state legislator who attempted to revoke a charter granted to him to revoke it when his rail was laid halfway across the state. Some legislators had plans to make a fortune on a Taggart stock by selling it short. Nat Taggart was indicted for the murderer, but the charge could never be proved. What? But the charge could never be proved. What about proven? He had no trouble with legislators, legislators from then on. I don't know, but I've watched them here for 20 years and I've seen the change. They used to rush through here and it was wonderful to watch. It was the hurry of men who knew where they were going and were eager to get there. Now they're hurrying because they are afraid. There is not a purpose that drives them, it's fear. They're not going anywhere, they are escaping. And I don't think they know what it is that they want to escape. They don't look at another one. They jerk when brushed against. They smile too much, but it's an ugly kind of smiling. It's not joy, it's pleading. I don't know what it is that's happening to the world. He shrugged. Oh well, who is John Gold? The men sat around the long table, listening. They did not think of what they would have to do, but of what they would have to say to the man they represented. There was no flattered pleasure in his voice and no modesty. This, she knew, was a tribute to her, the rarest one person could play another. The tribute of feeling free to acknowledge one's own greatness, knowing that it is understood. Francisco could do anything he undertook. He could do it better than anyone else, and he did it without effort. There was no boasting in his manner and consciousness, no thought of comparison. His attitude was not, I can do it better than you, but simply, I can do it. What he meant by doing was doing superlatively. Francisco, what is the most depraved type of human being? The man without a purpose. Dagny, there is nothing of any importance in life, except how well you do your work. Nothing. Only that. Whatever, whatever else you are will come from that. It's the only message, I'm sorry, it's the only measure of human value. All the codes of ethics they'll try to ram down your throat are just so much paper 
so much paper money put out by swindlers to fleece people of their virtues. The code of competence is the only system of morality that is on a gold standard. In the many months of his absence, she never wondered whether he was true to her or not. She knew he was. She knew, even though she was too young to know the reason, that indiscriminate desire and unselective indulgence were possible only to those who regarded sex and themselves as evil. It would work very simply, said Bath Eubank. There should be a law limiting the sale of any book to 10,000 copies. This would throw the literary market open to new talent, fresh ideas and non-commercial writing. If people were forbidden to buy a million copies of the same piece of trash, they would be forced to buy better books. Which is very true, by the way. I like that one, but I especially like Francisco. Francisco, what's the most depraved type of human being? A man or woman, actually, without a purpose. And it is so fucking true. Like, yeah, it's the case. It totally is the case. If you don't have any purpose, or at least if you don't find any purpose in whatever the fuck you're doing each and every fucking day, then you're going to be miserable. And you're going to feel incredibly bad. And I fucking know that. And I felt it, unfortunately. Only those whose motive is not money-making should be allowed to write. I have observed that Mr. Radden has been trying to avoid the necessity of presenting me to you, and I can guess the reason. Would you prefer that I leave your house? The action of naming an issue instead of evading it was so unlike the usual behavior of all the men he knew, it was such a sudden, startling relief that uh, Riordan remained silent for a moment studying Daconia's face. Francisco had said it very simply, neither as, an, uh, as a reproach nor as a plea, but in a manner which strangely acknowledged Riordan's dignity and his own... No, and his own, sorry. No, said Riordan, whatever else you guessed, I did not say that. I don't understand it, but I do understand being differently than anybody else. And why this often... Or sometimes. It depends on what type of different. Because of course you can also be um, different in a negative way. I mean if everybody's doing pretty good and you're not doing pretty good. Then well it's not better. You understand? But um, but yeah. You know you, you really can make a difference by being different. To me there is only one form of human depravity. Or depravity whatever. The man without a purpose. Well once again and once again I do want to say yes. They never found it. For centuries afterward, the man said it was only a legend. They did not believe it, but they never stopped looking for it, because they knew that that was what they had to find. He told himself that he deserved the torture, because he had wished never to touch her again, and was unable to maintain his decision. He despised himself for that, he despised a need which now held no shred of joy or meaning which had become the mere need of a woman's body, an anonymous body that belonged to a woman whom he had to forget while he held it. He became convinced that the need was depravity, or depravity, whatever. I've hired you to do a job, not to do your best, whatever that is. By the way, I think sounds sounds way more real than... um, And I kind of heard it, I, I think... Seth Godin talking about it and like, okay, um, sometimes communists don't want you to be uh, uh, even better. You know, they want you to do your job, but with being better comes being, well, probably also acting differently, you know, and or different from now or different from just doing the job, which means that you, you know, you're maybe going to stand up for yourself Maybe you're going to be this person who's trying to lead others. Maybe you're just um, disrupting the system a bit, you know. And only if it is a bit, it probably would be enough to um, to make a boss or make somebody that is of um, higher level than you are. Be like, well, fuck you. Don't do that, you know, because you're disrupting my system. Do your job. Don't be better at what you do than you're supposed to to be. John Galt spent years looking for it. He crossed oceans and he crossed deserts and he went down into forgotten mines, miles under the earth. 
but he found it on the top of a mountain. It took him 10 years to climb that mountain. It broke every bone in his body, it tore the skin of his hands, it made him lose his home, his name, his love. But he climbed it, he found the fountain of youth, which he wanted to bring down to man. Only he never came back. Why didn't he? She asked, because he found that it could be brought down. It couldn't be brought down. Um, Ayn Rand shrugged. I do want to... If there is any interpretation or any explanation for what this book actually is about. Atlas Shrugged is a 1957 novel by Ayn Rand, Rand's fourth and final novel. It was also her longest and the one she considered to be her magnum opus. Which, as far as I believe, is like kind of the best work that he did or something. Uh, in the realm of fiction writing, Atlas Shrugged includes elements of science fiction, mystery and romance, and it contains Rand's most extensive statement of objectivism in any of her works of fiction. The theme of Atlas Shrugged, as Rand described, it is the role of a man's mind in existence. The book explores a number of philosophical themes from which Rand would subsequently develop objectivism. In doing so, it expresses the advocacy of reason, individualism and cap capitalism and depicts what Rand saw to be the failures of government coercion. The book depicts a dystopia in the United States in which private businesses suffer under increasingly burdensome laws and regulations. Railroad executive Dagny Target and her lover steel magnate Hank Riordan struggle against looters who wants to exploit their productivity. Um, history, early novel idea in Russia, context and writing, influences, themes, philosophy. What about philosophy? The story of Atlas Shrugged dramatically expresses Rand's ethical egoism, her advocacy of rational selfishness, whereby all of the principal virtues and vices are applications of the role of reasons um, as man's basic tool of survival or a failure to apply it. Rationality, honesty, justice, independence, integrity, productiveness, and pride. Rand's characters often personify her view of the archetypes of various schools of philosophy for living and working in the world. Robert James Bidinotto wrote, Rand's rejected the literary, literary convention that depth and plausibility meet in everyday life, uttering everyday dialogue and pursuing everyday values. But she also rejected the notion that characters should be symbolic rather than realistic. And Rand herself stated, My characters are never symbols. They are merely men in sharper focus than the audience can see with unaided sight. My characters are persons in whom certain human attributes are focused more sharply and consistently than in average human beings. Which make them, you know, living pretty much on the edge, you know, as I'm understanding it, like... Okay, you're going to have this person. This person is so stereotypical, um, yeah. period. In addition to the Paul's more obvious statement about the significance of industrialists to society and the sharp contrast to Marxism and the labor theory of value, this explicit conflict is used by Rand to draw wider philosophical conclusions, both implicit in the plot and via the character's own statements. Etzler shrugged caricatures, fascism, socialism and communism, and any state intervention in society as allowing unproductive people to leech the hard-earned wealth of the productive and rent contends that the outcome of any individual's life is purely a function of their ability and that any individual could overcome adverse circumstances given ability and intelligence. And yeah, without adding too much, I'm going to end this episode. So I'm going to see you soon. Bye-bye. Wish you the fucking best. See you.